Coming up on DTNS, Neuro and FedEx team up to have driverless cars deliver your packages. Razor switches to AMD for its latest gaming laptop. And Christian Cantrell helps us find the interesting future uses of NFTs. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, June 15th, 2021. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Joining us, Christian Cantrell, who runs design prototyping at Adobe and author of four science fiction novels, including Scorpion, which was optioned for film and just recently released. I, I was lucky enough to have Christian ask me uh, to interview him for his book launch uh, that we did online uh, a few weeks ago. Christian, good to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks so much for having me back. I think we determined that it was 2014 that I was last on, so... Yeah, it's uh, it's been a minute, so you yeah. know, let's not make it so long. Uh, yeah, next for sure. Time. Uh, we were just talking uh, about the Gmail, the new Gmail interface. If you if you want to hear live troubleshooting of uh, Tom and Sarah <laughs> trying to message each other over the new Google Chat, uh, get Good Day Internet. Become a member at Patreon.com/slash/DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. <laughs> The UK's Competition and Markets Authority announced an official investigation into the mobile device ecosystem, looking into the dominance of iOS and Android and the control that both have over app marketplaces. Results of the investigation are expected to be published within a year. The CMA previously announced an investigation into whether Apple un unfairly favored itself in the iOS app store. The U.S. Supreme Court has overruled a 2019 Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals decision that had barred LinkedIn from preventing HiQ Labs from harvesting personal data from public profiles. So if you're not following it, the decision was HiQ Labs can harvest the details from LinkedIn, and the Supreme Court said, mm, no, we're throwing out that decision. The appeals court had ruled that the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act did not apply when no authorization was needed to access public user data. In other words, it's just there on the web. Uh, the ruling was sent back to the Ninth Circuit by the Supreme Court to reconsider in light of the Supreme Court's own June 4th ruling on the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which did find that someone could not be found guilty under the law for misusing information on a system they have permission to access. So it could end up with the same decision. It just needs a different legal justification. OnePlus announced the Nord N200 5G for $240, going on sale in the U.S. to T-Mobile and Metro customers June 25th. It'll also come to Canada for $320 Canadian dollars. The N25 G has a 6.49-inch HD 90 hertz display, Qualcomm Snapdragon 480 chipset, so this is a budget phone, with 4 gigs of RAM and 64 gigs of expandable storage. The N200 has three, three rear lenses with a 13-megapixel main sensor, 16-megapixel front cam, 5,000 milliamp battery is rechargeable using an 18 watt fast charger. In honor of Zelda's 35th birthday, Nintendo is launching another Game & Watch system. This is the Legend of Zelda Game & Watch system. 50 bucks coming November 12th. The, uh, the, the little portable game that predated the Game Boy is Game & Watch. So this is a kind of a nostalgia play for that. It includes the original Legend of Zelda, The Adventure of Link, the Game Boy version of Link's Awakening, and Vermin, the Link version, plus a built-in interactive digital clock and timer, because hence the name, uh, featuring OG Link. Nintendo also announced the sequel to The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild will arrive next year, 2022. IRL is a new-ish social network, it's been around for two years, has 12 million monthly users, many of them under the age of 18, a lot of college students as well, focusing on group chats, events, polls, and supposed to be about people doing eventual things together, like meeting up in real life, hence the name IRL. CEO Abraham Shafi tells The Verge that the app builds Facebook groups and events for the generation that doesn't use Facebook. Also says that the goal is to become a super messaging social network like WeChat for the rest of the world. Yeah, Sarah and I uh, tried it out. Sarah invited me to uh, to a chat on IRL. <laughs> I do it a lot, a lot of that today. Really, really, really wants your contacts. Like it asked me four times uh, to access my contacts. So, you know, something to be aware of. All right, let's talk a little more about the new announcements at E3 from Razor. What do they got, Sarah? 
Well, Razer announced a new version of its Blade 14 gaming laptop, and for the first time, runs on AMD, not Intel, specifically an 8-core overclockable AMD Ryzen 9 5900HX CPU. Also comes with either a 1080p 144Hz or 1440p 165Hz display, GeForce RTX 3060, 3070, or 3080 GPU, and acclaimed 12 hours of battery life, shipping June 14th and starting at 1799 Razer's calling it the smallest gaming laptop available at 12.59 by 5.66 by 0.66 inches. That's pretty thin, but that's not all. Remember Razer's LED-filled N95 mask? Well, finally it has a ship date. The Hazel N95, as it's known, will be released in limited quantities with the first batch scheduled for this October. Since the announcement, they've also added an anti-fog coating, what they still haven't announced, though, is a price. So it is coming in October, but we don't know for how much yet. If after buying your new Razer Blade 14 and Hazel N95 mask, you still have $180 left over, well, you're in luck because you can buy Razer's new 130-watt gallium nitride charger. Small enough to fit into a pocket, and when plugged in, can charge two USB-C devices at 100 watts and two USB-A devices at 18 watts all at the same time. International adapters are included in the box, and it should be available sometime in the next 30 days. Man, at 180 bucks, you would expect them to include more uh, in the box. That's it's pretty pricey for that kind of thing, which isn't a brand new kind of thing. Uh, but it is really small, and the plug's collapsible, so maybe you're paying for the design. Uh, Christian, of of these three products, uh, which catches your attention most? Well, in terms of what I'd want, for sure the laptop. Um, I I love these laptops. Um, I, I love what they make, and I'm super curious about these Ryzen processors. I've not used one yet, um, but this. Project Hazel, I think, is super interesting because it's it's interesting to kind of launch this now, right? Uh, I mean, so I wonder what their calculus is, right? They're either betting that masks are a permanent part of life now, or they're like betting on another pandemic or something, or both? Well, I mean, I was thinking the same thing, Christian, and I guess... You know, when you're talking about airplane travel and, you know, I don't know, they, there's just certain places where it's like, sure, we're not going to just, masks aren't going to go away. And does something like this very cool Hazel N95 mask become some sort of a status symbol, like a handbag, you know, where, you know, up until now, a lot of us are just like, whatever mask I've got, you know, nearest me is fine, right? And you have a few of them, maybe it becomes a kind of like special mask that sets you apart from the crowd. I'm going to guess that uh, the LED filled N95 mask that if you have to ask how much it is, <laughs> maybe you can't afford it because they haven't given us a price yet. Is it necessarily marketed as a practical item, right? Like this is this is for people to buy because they just want to have it. Uh, they they got people excited about it. And, and now, you know, it's not like masks, like you said, it's not like masks are totally gone. They're still used in a few places. Uh, and so you can justify saying, oh, I'm going to get the mask uh, because you just want it because it looks pretty. Uh, you know, a perfect mask to wear to the club, I would I would imagine. It, there one, you go. Or to go to clubs, which I don't. But, you know, your mileage, your mileage may vary. Uh, yeah, I'm with, I'm with you on the uh, the laptop uh, being the thing that uh, is, is catching my eye. And a few people are in our chat room. W's got us one uh, among them saying like, yeah, AMD really does seem to be getting the advantage here, uh, showing up in more and more products. Well, folks, have you ever been included in a tweet and all its replies you had nothing to do with and did not care to keep seeing? Uh, I've had this happen to me where I'll say something and someone else says something either saucy or critical in response. And then someone else takes exception with to their response. And then those two people start fighting in my at replies. And I'm at, I have nothing to do with it because they're fighting with each other, not with the thing I originally posted. And I'm like, can I please unsubscribe? But there's no way to do that. Well, you can mute the tweet thread in some apps, but short of blocking the users, which seems a little extreme in that case, you usually just have to wait for it to fizzle out. And sometimes like zombies, old tweets like this reemerge. Twitter product designer Dominic Kamotzi has shared an early concept of something that might help with this, an unmention feature that would let you unlink yourself from a tweet and then prevent it from being used in future replies. 
So not only remove yourself from the thread, but stop them from re-adding you to it if they decided they wanted to, which for abusive scenarios could be pretty important. The mock-ups show that you can edit your mentions in the privacy and safety settings if you change your mind later, so you could add yourself back in. Also, if someone you don't follow at replies you, you could prevent them from mentioning you ever again. You could just not block somebody, but block them from at replying you, from tagging you. Uh, another proposal would let you restrict certain accounts from mentioning you at all, and even pause all mentions of you for a period of time. They they suggest one, three, or seven days might be the time. You're like, I don't want to block them from ever mentioning, but I don't want to hear from them for three days. Boom, there you go. Uh, none of these features are real. They're all still in the design stage. They just want feedback from people. That's why they're putting this out there into the world. They may or may not come to the platform, uh, but Sarah, uh, <laughs> do you want any of these to come to the platform? Yes, I do. And yeah, it's it's kind of like the scenario that you described, Tom, where, you know, let, I don't know, let's say, yeah, someone who I don't know tweets something, I don't see the tweet, but someone else replies to that tweet and maybe says something like, oh yeah, I remember when at Sarah Lane reviewed something like that on a show like a million years ago. And then it kind of turns into this whole thread where I'm like, well, the one tweet was fine, you know, but now there, there's sort of a conversation that has nothing to do with, with me and I'm not contributing at all. And I could just like to quietly leave, you know, <laughs> I'd like to just quietly leave. So I think that the unmentioned feature specifically is great because yeah, blocking is, blocking is appropriate in certain situations. Sure. Muting is appropriate in certain situations. Uh, but an unmentioned feature, specifically something that, yeah, might be part of an event, um, just, you know, so you're, you're un, you're getting unmentioned or you're, you're, you're keeping yourself from being mentioned, uh, for a set period of time does, does come in handy. You know, all of this stuff, uh, you know, there it's granular tweaks that I know a lot of people who use Twitter don't use or care about, but I think they're really important for power users and people who really want to uh, customize the experience as much as possible. Okay, we can't edit our tweets ever, but this is, you know, <laughs> still a step in the right direction. It's sort of editing. You can edit yourself out. Uh, kind of, yeah. yeah. I, I, I think, yeah, when you're you're like, listen, these are just two people that I don't necessarily want to block from being ever seen again. But I just don't want to hear this anymore. That seems useful to me. Also, the ability to restrict anyone from mentioning you is not something I would see myself necessarily having to use ever. But there are people who get trolled, who get, you know, massively trolled. And they they couldn't possibly go block and mute all the accounts that are at replying them. So that would be a, a way to just say, like, hey, just eliminate it all. Stop stop them all from showing up in my mentions. Uh, Christian, I, I, you know, the, the social media game is is fraught with peril for anyone who ventures into it. What do you make of any of this? Uh, I just want my edit button. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in favor of anything that gives people more control over uh, how often they're getting notifications, how often they're getting pinged. Uh, I mean, one of the reasons why I'm not super active on social media is because uh, it's um, I, I love interacting with people online, but um, you know I, I need to sort of eliminate the distraction. So any kind mm -hmm. of features that give you know more, more granular control over how to reduce the noise, I'm all for. Yeah, I'm, I I I think there are probably some downsides in uh, in ha in the record of the tweet. So the way this is working in these mockups is the at replies disappear, and you don't know that they were in there to begin with. I, I would rather see them just go gray, right? So they're no longer clickable. They no longer show up in the at replies. Uh, but but if I stumble across that tweet, I can see like, oh, they did at reply that person, but it's no longer linked. So that person must have removed themselves. And and blocking them from further mentions, sure, I, I think that's that's fine. Uh, but I, I do I do wonder about just having a, a clear record of what happened. Maybe maybe that would be a tweak I would make. Otherwise, I'm not seeing too many downsides to this. No. Yeah. And, and especially when it comes to the abuse stuff or just, I don't know, let's say you're a, you're, you know, you're a journalist who's written something that has, you know, sparked a spirited debate, good sure. and bad, you know, that sort of thing where it's like, you know, my thing is out there and I don't need any death threats about this. I, I can see where this, this would be a, a, a extremely helpful tool. So you kind of don't get into the you know, wastewater of the social internet. Yeah, I feel like you want to participate for a while and then eventually you want to opt out, right? And, and, and this gives you that option. Yeah. Yeah.
Uh, also another option, Neuro is expanding its partnership with FedEx to use Neuro's driverless pods for last mile deliveries at large scale. Neuro has been conducting tests for about five years now with grocery stores, pharmacies, even pizza places. Neuro started a pilot program in April with FedEx using its current Neuro 2 pods. And Tuesday, it announced a multi-year partnership to deliver FedEx packages in the next generation of Neuro pods in multiple markets. Neuro has an exemption from the U.S. Department of Transportation to operate on public roads, meaning it can where others can't. And California granted it permission to charge for services in parts of Santa Clara and San Mateo counties. FedEx is still developing its own autonomous sidewalk robots called Roxo in collaboration with Dean Kamen's DECA company, D-E-K-A. The project aims to deliver from retailers like hardware stores, drug stores, and restaurants to nearby residences. One of the advantages of the neuro system would be that you can know or even schedule when exactly do you have your package delivered. Extremely helpful. And can also have robots come and pick up a package that you want to ship. UPS is also testing an autonomous delivery truck system, so your first experience with an autonomous car might actually be getting one of those packages that you're so used to, a human and a truck delivering you. Yeah, over the uh, the many years since Christian was last on the show, uh, Neuro has has risen from uh, you know being one of the first to even test a driverless car. If you if you haven't seen the neuro cars, they're like short little mini buses. There's no space for a person in them, so they don't have a steering wheel. They don't have a brake. Uh, they are really just oversized sidewalk robots. They're big enough to be on a regular road, uh, but they're not huge, and they go at a slower speed. So they they just go along you know your residential streets, and they've been testing them over and over. I think they tested them in Arizona with Kroger. They tested them with CVS. They tested them with Kroger in Houston. Uh, and, and in April, when they started testing with FedEx, I thought, okay, that's interesting. They're getting into logistics. So this is the first time that we've seen them have an agreement that says we're going to, we plan anyway, to use them everywhere. Uh, and one of the things FedEx is saying is places where it's actually more difficult to get to uh, so, you know, if your your driver has uh, 15 houses on a route and then there's one package that's like 10 miles out in the country. You could send a neuropod out there to deliver that one and not have to send that one truck all the way out there and back. Uh, but I think the thing that appeals to me most, Sarah, is what you were saying about being able to schedule it, to know mm -hmm. that for sure this pod can bring me my package at this time when I'm home. Yeah, you'd, you'd be able to check it on a map. You'd be able to get uh, notifications. Um, you'd be able to, you know, if you have to run out, maybe reschedule it. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah. Think this, I think this, this technology is fantastic because, you know, a lot of this technology is really about um, gathering training data, um, which you can then leverage for, uh, for other kinds of autonomous uh, transportation, right? So, you know, the more we can get, you know, things like prescriptions and pizzas uh, being delivered where the, you know, if it's late or if there's an accident or something goes wrong, the stakes are relatively low, uh, the better, right? Um, and then, you know, that training data can, can, you know, potentially be used for higher stakes things like eventually moving people around. Yeah, I, I do. I'm starting to think that having a package delivered to you by some kind of rolling robot that doesn't have a person inside might be most people's first interaction with an autonomous vehicle of some sort. Miravina uh, in our uh, Twitch chat was like, what's going to keep trolls from tipping these things over? They're, they're fairly big. Uh, I'm not saying it would be impossible, but you might need a couple of people to tip these over. We're not talking about the little Star Labs uh, sidewalk uh, drones or, or sidewalk robots. I also don't think that's going to happen as much as people think it will happen. I'm sure it will. Well, they, they will defend themselves, right? I mean, certainly they'll, they'll have <laughs> they weapons robots, on board, exactly. right? Yeah. <laughs> hey, folks, uh, make sure that you don't miss the show next week. All next week is Accessibility Week. Each day we're going to feature a guest that will talk about technology accessibility from testing products to developing UIs. Uh, it'll be the normal show news-wise, but we'll have a special segment from each guest talking about how important technology is to accessibility and how important accessibility is to technology. It all starts next week, starting Monday, June 21st. <laughs> Oh, we've talked about Beeple's digital art. We've talked about Kings of Leon albums and even Nyan Cat all being sold as NFT, a non-fungible token. Well, NFTs are a way of almost permanently marking someone as the owner of something without restricting its digital distribution. The most recent example is the World Wide Web itself. Tim Berners-Lee just announced 
that from June 23rd until June 30th, Sotheby's will conduct an auction of an NFT of the original source code for the World Wide Web. That's about 10,000 lines of code or so. Bidding starts at $1,000, and proceeds will go to support causes supported by Berners-Lee and his wife, so mostly charities. But the source code of the web is open. Anybody can have it. it. You can go download it right now. It's been open for a long time. So it's tempting to talk once again about why would anyone pay to be called the owner of something that's infinitely copyable. But Christian suggested we take a more interesting approach to NFTs this time. Right now, people get a kick out of being able to say, I'm the owner of NyanCat or the web, but maybe that's just the thing that makes it popular. Once that novelty wears off, Christian, what else do you think NFTs are going to be good for? Yeah, I mean, I think I think NFTs are an extremely compelling alternative to uh, to things like you know limiting distribution of content through you know purely legal means, uh, security by obscurity, things like you know YouTube trying to prevent you from downloading videos, um, and of course the big one is uh, technologies like DRM, right? So so one of the biggest uh, criticisms, um, which you just kind of mentioned, Tom, that I see of NFTs is this sort of like the screenshot argument, I call it, right? Which is like, well, I can just screenshot it, like screenshots, the new the new art theft, um, things like that. But I actually think that that's their greatest strength, right? So NFTs, in my view, work with the uh, the infinitely copyable nature of digital content, right? Whereas, whereas I would argue that DRM fights against it. Uh, so I love the fact that NFTs allow you to verifiably own something uh, but also potentially at the same time uh, share it with the world if you choose to, right? And it's no accident that someone like Tim Berners-Lee is um, is looking at NFTs for a way to get to get something out there, right? That's not, you know, uh, he sort of famously did not patent a lot of this technology uh, that that he's now giving away. Um, so this is, you know, you can kind of see where there's some overlap there. Uh, I recognize that that um, the NFT model is not going to work for for everybody and for all kinds of creative digital content, but. I think it can provide uh, some creators and some some content consumers with a really compelling alternative uh, to to what I consider to be sort of more brute force uh, concepts like DRM. Yeah, and we'll have a full explanation of NFTs. In fact, it's already up uh, if you want it at our sister show, knowalittlemore.com. Uh, but for the purposes of this conversation, uh, how how can NFT work instead of DRM? Because I, I get what you're saying. DRM tries to fight against infinitely copyable by locking things up, which as often as not punishes the legitimate user uh, as it does the pirate. Uh, how, how can NFTs work for content authenticity? Yeah, I, I think that NFTs um, create sort of a, a new kind of content distribution, right? Whereas... Um, a DRM tries to turn digital content um, into sort of a physical good where there's only one of them, right? Um, but that's we all know that that's not how digital content works. So I don't think there's a one-to-one -one correlation necessarily between uh, you know sort of the physical world and NFTs, and that's kind of what's exciting about it in my mind. So what you can do with an NFT is you can mint it, uh, you can sell it, um, one can buy it, you can trade it, um, you know, all of those kinds of things. Um, but you can also choose. Uh, a license around it potentially. And by the way, this is a little bit forward looking, right? I mean, there's still so many pieces that need to be that need to be put in place, right? And in particular, I just mentioned licensing. Licensing is something that that um, is still uh, somewhat opaque and, and fairly murky. So these things need to be worked out. But in theory, uh, you could create something, you could create a track, you could create a comic, you could take, you know, uh, if you're a photographer, you could go out there and create photos. And I think that a lot of us, you know, a lot of content creators, you know, it could be a book, right? It could be, you know, it could be anything. Um, we really want to share these things with, with the world, but we also want uh, some sort of monetization strategy. We want to support what we do at the same time. Um, and I think that NFTs create a new way to do that because uh, it, there's nothing about the NFT that makes something so that it can't be copied, right? And that's the thing that, again, as I said before, people tend to criticize. I think that's a strength because what you can do is uh, you can you can give your work to the world. People can enjoy it. People can you know use your meme or you know use your whatever it is for a background, or they can share it. They can get value and enjoyment out of it. But people can also buy the deeds to it, right? In some in some sense, right? They can they can invest in the ownership of it. And and I feel like for some things, not everything, but for some things, it 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 can really give us the best of both worlds. Yeah, one of, one of the things we've experienced with Daily Tech News Show is there are people who listen to the feed with ads but still support us on Patreon 
because they want to feel like they have an interest in the show. They want to express their support of the show. I could see people feeling like, hey, yes, uh, this ebook is free and I, I don't have to pay for it, but I want to pay for the NFT. In fact, I want to pay for the NFT of the ebook so I can prove that I supported the artist. There's, the, you know, the bragging rights is not as silly in that respect where you're saying, hey, I'm not just showing that I'm some kind of owner. Uh, because this isn't the only NFT of this ebook. I'm showing that I supported my, you know, my author. And I think for a lot of fan bases, like you say, it doesn't work for everything, but for a lot of fan bases, that's the kind of thing they want to be able to show. It's a badge of honor. It's like a membership card, if you will. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I have uh, vinyl albums, but I don't even own a record player, right? Uh, and I and I. <laughs> And I do that to support the artists, right? I have a I have a Tycho album right right over there on my wall, actually, because I, I love Tycho and I love what he does, uh, and I want to support it. Um, so I I really think that you know there's um, and, and I want to emphasize that there's so much that's still missing from this, right? There's there's a content authenticity problem, you know, um, when you look at something high profile like People or like Grimes or like Tim Berners Lee, you know, you see you have to go to a Sotheby's or a Christie's or something, you know, and and you do that because you're sort of uh, you know, that's that's kind of a proxy for um, for for guaranteeing the authenticity of it. Um, so so there are a million problems to solve. There are a million technological problems. There are the issues with marketplaces. There are issues, obviously, with the, you know, the carbon footprint of the cryptocurrencies that sure, back sure. these things up. I mean, you know, we can we can go through the whole list. Um, but what the, what I like to do is um Whenever I see sort of a new paradigm like this, I like to ask myself this question of, um, you know, can I imagine a future without this technology, right? So once you kind of get a taste of it and you and you see it, you know, whether that's something like, you know, AR, VR, or, you know, some, something like that, you know, there are all kinds of problems with these technologies early on, you know, I mean, AR, you know, causes, uh, sorry, uh, VR causes these, you know, sort of VR headaches and, and you know, um, motion sickness and stuff like that. But once you once you sort of see these things and you can, you can, um, the important thing is not to sort of enumerate the problems with them in my mind. Um, the important thing is to really figure out what they can enable, what the strengths are, and then entrepreneurs can come in and, and people can come in and start fixing a lot of those problems. That's where I see NFTs. I think there's tremendous opportunity in NFT. I think we're still a long ways from getting there. Uh, but the, there's, a, there's a new kind of ownership that this creates that, uh, that allows people to, to share in digital you know, creativity uh, without it being locked down, without it being, you know, onerous, um, but also have, you know, bragging rights, have ownership and investments too. And there's nothing wrong with speculative assets here, right? There's nothing wrong with saying, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to pick up some early versions of this and, you know, maybe I'm a fan, maybe I'm an investor, maybe, you know, sort of like an art investor, right? Maybe I'm going to sell this stuff later on that, you know, there's nothing wrong with that either. I, I think it's it's too early to say all the things that it could be used for, but uh, what I try to do with NFT, because it's easy to take pot shots at it. It's easy to, to poke holes in, in what won't work with it. But what I try to look at is, but what benefits from proof of ownership? Yeah, uh, it's not going to stop you from copying something. No, it's not going to stop somebody from taking a screenshot. But that's not really what it's good for. It's good for proving you paid for this right. And and what are the other things they could do? Uh, if you got ideas, if you're like, wait, that gives me an idea, feedback at dailyticknewsshow.com. Let us know what it is. Uh, well, you might think that smart bulbs are pretty smart, but the site Next Hack posted pretty smart little project. It was an IKEA trod-free smart LED bulb. IKEA has smart bulbs like a lot of companies do. And it was running Doom. The game had to be modified to run on the light bulbs. 108 kilobytes of RAM. <laughs> That's, yeah. <laughs> That's what it was. With an actual display and game buttons added to the bulbs, MGM at 210L RF board. However, don't get too excited. The post was subsequently removed. With Next Hack posting, it had a request to remove this post and all public material. I wonder who requested that. It wasn't can't think doomed. of. Can't think of. Well, probably IKEA. <sighs> But it's just hacking the bulb. Come on, IKEA. This is I don't, cool. I mean, listen, They're putting I don't, a display I don't, on it. That's amazing. I don't know that, I don't know that for a fact. Yeah, but... we don't know. That's right. We shouldn't. We yeah. shouldn't throw IKEA under its very tiny bus yet. Uh, <laughs> very <laughs> tiny flat bus. But if you've done anything like this, we do want to hear about it. <laughs> we really do. Do not delay. Email us right now at feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. In fact, email us with. Any questions or comments on anything that you hear on uh, our shows, our discussions with our guests, something we might talk about on a future show, and anything in between.
We also like to shout out patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Erwin Stirr, Ken Hayes, and Philip Shane. Today, we also have a brand new boss, Skarov Pai, who just started backing us on Patreon. Gaurav, Thank you, Gaurav. Listen, Gaurav. Listen. Right now, at this very moment, Gaurav Pai is my favorite person in the world. See? Could be you tomorrow. See? Could be you. Yeah. All I got to do is back us be. on Patreon. Could be. Yeah. Although Warov is still going to be on the, then you're just going to have two favorite people tomorrow, exactly. maybe even three. I, well, I'll have four thousand nine hundred and sixty-four or whatever favorite people, really. But there he's my go. most recent favorite. Person. It's a it's a great club to join. Thank you so much. Thanks to all our patrons. Also, thanks to Christian Contrell for being with us today. Christian, where can people find what you're up to day to day? Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me. Uh, ChristianCantrell.com. Uh, you can find my books and other things that I'm up to. Uh, and I'm also at Cantrell on Twitter. Excellent. Well, thanks for being with us. We are live on this show Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC is when it happens. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we'll be back tomorrow with the one and the only Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>